Okay, we're up. This is the Our Town, North Alabama's podcast. And this is going to be episode number 102, I believe. I believe that's where this is going to fall out. Episode 100 just got released today, or yesterday. Today's Tuesday. It was yesterday. It's starting to be promoted today. And uh, what's cool is episode 101 is about a, a, uh, a, new th- a book called 15 Tango, which are the Blackhawk Chiefs, right? Right. And I noticed in your bio, and I'm going to introduce uh, retired Lieutenant General Neil Thurgood, L. Neil Thurgood, named after his father, right? That's correct. Leon, yeah, Leon. your first name? Yeah. Um, why don't we do this before I forget? Why don't I do your intro? So uh, let me just read a little bit from the bio that was sent on introducing you. I'm not going to read the whole thing. Yeah, please don't. <laughs> but my mother enough. loves it. Because <laughs> the thing, the thing about you, I, am I calling you Neil Thurgood? What do you want me to just call Neil. you? Just Neil. Just Neil. There's a when Neil is a man of many things, right? You've done. You have. You have a a illustrious career, and uh, and sometimes you sit here and it's like, where do you start, right, with someone? I don't know where to start at the time. <laughs> now we're going to start probably more in the present day, think, then go all the way back. But um, this is your bi- biography as it's listed on UAH. And, of course, in a minute here, we'll explain a little bit more about your role there. But uh, retired Lieutenant General L. Neil Thurgood is the special advisor to the UAH president, who's Chuck Carr, right? And fairly right, recent. Right. President Carr. President uh, Carr is, what, maybe less than two years in his role? Just about two years now. Two years now. Uh, for military affairs and technology. Prior to his appointment at UAH, he served as the director for hypersonics, directed energy, Space and Rapid Acquisition in the Office of the Assistant Secretary of the Army, Acquisition, Logistics, and Technology at Redstone Arsenal, Alabama. In this role, Lieutenant Thurgood was responsible for the, um, Lieutenant General, I'm sorry, was responsible for the fielding of select capabilities to deter and counter rapidly modernizing adversaries. He oversaw the development of an Army long-range hypersonic weapon and led the Army Rapid Capabilities and Critical Technologies Office uh, infamously called RICTO, it right? Is. Yeah, that, that is what everybody uses it colloquially. In research, develop, developing, prototyping, testing, evaluating, procuring, and fielding critical technologies and capabilities consistent with the Army's modernization priorities. So that's what you were kind of most recently doing for the Army before you retired. Yeah, that was my last position <clears throat> in the Army. Really a, really a great opportunity. You enlisted in 83, I believe. I did. Young PFC in the, in the infantry. And uh, later went back to get a degree and at the, at the coaxing of my parents, good for them, uh, to get a degree and, and became an officer, a pilot. Gotcha. Did you go down to Fort Rucker for that? I did, yeah. Fort Rucker, Alabama uh, for flight school. Um, oddly enough, my father went to flight school at Camp Rucker. Oh, really? When it was many, many years ago. Um, you mentioned my first name is the same as my father's first name. Which is which is great because we, you know, my father served a full career in the military as yeah. a pilot, two tours in Vietnam. Um, he flew Chinooks in Vietnam, really, uh, as part of his assignments. Um, I flew those same tail numbers in 1987 that he flew in 1967. I was then stationed in South Korea, uh, and uh, he flew them as A model Chinooks. I flew them as C model Chinooks. My my older brother Keith, yeah, who I'm sure we'll talk about, a uh, great, great, great brother. His son Ryan is also a Chinook pilot. Really? So he's the third generation of Thurgood's flying Chinooks in combat. Jeez. So it's a it's a great a great legacy for our family. And Rucker's now Novacell. It's been changed to Camp Novacell. Camp Novacell. You know, um, just as a quick aside, and just to kind of revisit the the, the Black Hawk episode I did. Um, I just interviewed also a lady whose husband was a chief warrant officer five, Julian Evans. Went in for rotator cuff surgery and blood clot, died of a pulmonary embolism. Oh, that's unfortunate. Recently. Beloved. A beloved individual in this area. Next, next week, we're actually going to a – she started a foundation in his name. She's a retired chief warrant officer four. Ah, uh, nice. Okay. And they're, they, uh, we know – Mutual friend, he was also on the program, John Kinsley, former colonel, retired out of AMC. Okay. He actually lives up the street from here. Um, he's helping a lot with their foundation, and we're going to have, like, a benefit dinner. Oh, very nice. But they, uh, he, 
he was the deputy uh, commandant for the the uh, warrant officer career college. Okay. Out of Nova Cell. For, uh, Camp Nova Cell, Fort Nova Cell. When he passed away. Right. So it's just, the one thing I love about this podcast, and t- it's just kind of telling the story of North Alabama and then how all of these pieces and parts come together. And there's many people who have said, hey, you need to have Neil Thurgood on your program. I'm like, <laughs> well, I don't know if I know this guy. <laughs> I don't know how I can make that happen. And uh, like Brian Weinberg, you know right. that name? I do. He yeah, works, absolutely. He works for Man Tech, and we share. Yeah. Uh, I told him I was going to be interviewing you, and he's like, man, Thurgood's awesome. You know, <laughs> I went and ate dinner with their family when I was at Acquisition Basic Course every Sunday, you know, and they he helped me rent a car once, you know, all, <laughs> all these things. It, it, this is a great community uh, for yeah. lots of reasons, lots of great, great people here. Um, if you look at the history – of this community, greater Huntsville, Madison area. Yeah. And look at the impact it's had on our nation uh, from a technology perspective, from a national defense perspective, from an innovative invention perspective, an education perspective. It has been incredible. Yeah. Well, and I, I would imagine you're seeing that now in this role you have with UAH. Yeah. Right. And they're, I, I guess, President Carr, who came up from Tuscaloosa himself, right? He had been down there for years. He's probably lying a lot of people on a lot of people in this community to make things happen, like the programs that you're you're spearheading, right, or championing at UAH. Well, it's it's interesting uh, when you when you look at this community in particular, right? You have um, the legacy of the Huntsville generations that have been here for for a long time, mm-hmm. and then when we brought the original Von Braun team here and began the technology maturation in this area. Uh, And now you have the center where we do all of our aviation, Army aviation programs, where we build design Blackhawks. I led that team for a while. Yeah. Um, Where you build design uh, fixed-wing aircraft, you build design all the missile systems. Uh, General Frank Lozano does that today. Mm -hmm. Rob Rash, who who replaced me, General Rash. The Missile Defense Agency, the Spatial Missile Defense Command, NASA. The amount of technology that here is here brings in such a wide breadth of people to this area that are high complex thinkers. I mean, they are some of the most brilliant thinkers uh, in in our nation, probably in the world, that bring this technology to bear. And a lot of that gets started, and they get introduced to that here at the university, yeah, uh, University of, of of Huntsville here, uh, Alabama here in Huntsville. So that's, it, it plays a critical role. And so President Carr asked me to help flesh that out a little bit. How, how, do we, how do we get tied to that? And how do we continue that great relationship with not only the Redstone community, but the larger industrial-based community here in the Huntsville area? How much do you know of, has, has UAH always been that tied? Or is that something that kind of came later? From what you know, yeah, I think it kind of has ebbed and flowed over the years. Okay, right. I mean, I mean, the University of Huntsville uh, has its birth, has its legacy in propulsion and engineering. Yeah, which is which is how Redstone got started when we brought the Von Bronze here and and the, that whole whole group of people that really established the missile programs. Over the over the years, government funding ebbs and flows, and that relationship ebbs and flows with that. What's been constant is that the team of UAH, the professors, the instructors, the cadre, the, that their excellence and how they do that hasn't changed over the years. Mm-hmm. Um, how they got access to students and how we interface with the community hasn't changed over the years. And so they really have been a cornerstone of education uh, for this community and, and probably for the broader northern Alabama area, southern Tennessee area. And and that really is a unique thing that is tied to this high technology that we have here in this area that's unlike any other other place where a, a high-end engineering school, business school, arts and science school, music, yeah. all the, the, the domains of a college that fit so well with the community. How soon – so, you know, it's, it's interesting. How, what was your father's rank did, before he retired? So my father uh, served as a – retired as a lieutenant colonel. Okay, Lieutenant Colonel. And, uh, you know, I just remember uh, as a young boy when I was – he was stationed at uh, – after his second tour, 
um, in Vietnam. He was at Fort Benning. I think I was in second grade at the mm-hmm. time. And uh, I remember there was a family day. And uh, the families got to ride in a Huey. <laughs> we don't do that anymore in the, in the military, but generally speaking. But in those days, we got to ride in a Huey. And I remember sitting in that Huey with my father <laughs> and my older brother, Keith. Yeah. Uh, and I remember thinking, I'm going to do this one day. One day, I'm going to fly helicopters in the Army. <laughs> And uh, little did I know that, you know, at that point, 20 years later, 30 years, you know, 25 years later, that I would uh, yeah. go back to school, get a degree, and, and become a pilot like my father. Um, my older brother, Keith, who is just a great older brother in every sense of the word, he's helped put this program together that we're, we're going to uh, talk about here in a little bit. He retired as a two-star in the reserves, in the Army Reserves. He got out as a young captain, yeah. stayed in the reserve system, had a great career. But uh, he, he is a transportation corps officer, so he's responsible for trucks and moving things around the battlefield. And, of course, my father and I are always talking about aviation stories <laughs> and raising our hands, you know, and doing this. And, of course, we just aren't merciful to Keith. <laughs> he's got to fix your hot helicopter. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> but he's a, he's been a great, great brother. Well, I say that because I wasn't sure. I saw it, at least one article where it just referred to your father as a, you know, I can't remember how it said it, like, you know, some leadership ca- capacity. It was very general. Then, of course, you know, Keith was a major general retired and you're a lieutenant right. general retired. But – when in your growing up years were you, did you become aware of Huntsville and what was going on here that was like probably eye-opening for you at that time? Like, really? So, so I would tell you that in aviation, uh, when I, I didn't know about Huntsville really when I was young. I remember, I remember being with my father flying to Huey. I remember those kind of things, but I don't remember thinking and knowing about Huntsville at the time. It wasn't until... Uh, a pivotal time in my career when I, I made a career change within the Army construct. Mm-hmm. So a young enlisted soldier all the way at the time when I was uh, a lieutenant colonel, then I was on the operational side of the Army. And I made this change. And while I was on the operational side, then I started to know about PO Aviation, which does program executive office for aviation, which does all the design work for mm-hmm. all of our helicopters, fixed wing drones, all those things. At that time, they were up at St. Louis. Uh, that's where that, that command was. In, late, in the late 1990s and early 2000s, that moved to Huntsville. Mm. And, and so the center of Army aviation and the design of its future uh, aircraft and its current aircraft became centered here in Huntsville. And so then I, then I knew that. We all knew that. Aviators know who's designing their aircraft. A very tight relationship with Fort, what was then called Fort Rucker, mm-hmm. as you mentioned earlier. So that's when you begin to to know it. Uh, that led up to a kind of a midpoint in my career. I left kind of the operational side of the Army, went into the acquisition side of the Army, which is which is responsible on how we build things, design things, how we give things to our soldiers, mm-hmm. how we give fi- war fighting equipment to our soldiers. And and because I was an aviator, I I hoped to come to PEO Aviation, which is at, was at Redstone at that time. And so um, I actually was stationed here the first time in 2002. Okay. Uh, I was stationed here, assigned uh, to work on uh, aviation platforms. I worked on a bunch of them, um, was the commander for the Black Hawk program, uh, the Tango 15 book that you mentioned earlier, yeah. 15 Tango book. Um, have a love the, love the Black Hawk, spent a lot of time flying Black Hawks. Uh, uh, in and out of in and out of combat, and so I knew that if I was going to stay in aviation, that Huntsville would be the center of gravity, which is where PO Aviation is located. And uh, I was fortunate enough to to have a great team around me when we were doing the work on the Blackhawks and the Lakotas, the Chinooks, um, uh, and so that helped helped me to have a little bit of success. And then I went to the Pentagon, like we all do, yeah, and back and forth. And then um, when I got promoted to one star, I kind of stepped out of the aviation community specifically and went into the missile community. So I was, as an aviator, I was the program executive officer for PEO Missiles in Space, mm-hmm. which is also here at Redstone. And so 
And then I've been in the Pentagon, back to Redstone, into theater, back to Redstone, back to the Pentagon. <laughs> so I've had several tours here over the years, and and we have just come to love this community. Yeah. When it came time to retire um, in 22, just over a little over a year ago, um, you know, my dear wife, who's been with me for 38 years, my whole time in the Army, <laughs> I said, uh, what do you want to do? And for her, that was a pretty easy choice. She said, look, we're going to stay here in Huntsville. Our our family, my immediate, our immediate family of two daughters mm -hmm. and three grandkids, oddly enough, for a military family, they actually ended up in Huntsville also. Really? Uh, my brother's in Texas. My sister's in Utah. My parents are in Utah. We're all over the place. But, but oddly for our family, we ended up here in Huntsville. So yeah. Huntsville is, is an important place for our family. Um, and... And once the the nucleus of our family kind of came centered here, it became our home. Gotcha. And with the grandkids here, there is probably no chance we're leaving anytime soon. <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna be a grandpa in May. Oh, congratulations! I don't know if I look like one, but <laughs> well, I'm gonna you, you be have one. to get, lose a little more hair. <laughs> yeah, I, I think I, my hair stopped receding when I was 17. It just it just receded and it just stopped right there. <laughs> so I hope I'm good for a while. Can I tell you, I'm going to tell you one funny story. Yeah, absolutely. You piqued my interest when you said family day, and then we'll, we'll, we'll transition. Um, so I worked at, at, uh, at Langley CIA a, a few times. Like I would always tell anybody, if you're a contractor, any chance you can get, you have to work at a headquarters of any agency. That's right. Right. I know at, uh, at uh, VB3, if you're an MDA, you've got to go to VB3. <laughs> right? It's an amazing yes. atrium type thing. So when they were younger, I happened to work there, and they had family day. And family day, they, it's, you know, anything in the intel community, it's never not, not that great. You're not going into where I work, and even if we do, it's not, it's not glamorous. It's just a, a boring <laughs> skiff, you know. But they, you know, they have, a, they have a spy plane thing out on display in the parking lot. And they bring in their canine, you know, right, all these right. things. They, they, they have, like, fingerprinting um, disguises and stuff that they'll do. And there's a hot dog machine. There used to be this hot dog machine at headquarters, and it was a vending machine. And you would, like, especially if you worked late hours, and the food court, whatever, would close down by six p.m., seven p.m. Some people are, some people are just that place never stops, right? It's twenty four seven. Right. And, right. and so uh, there was plenty of times at night. We're like, well, what's my option? I'm gonna go down to the hot dog machine, and you. Okay, it was like a buck or something, or two bucks, <laughs> and you put your money in, and you choose like you want a ballpark or. A, was it a Kinsler or something? And then you watch it like grab this bun and it moves it over. And then the hot dog gets cooked somehow real quick. And then it puts it on the bun and then it delivers to you. Made fresh from a vending machine. Oh man. And the lot, like on family day, like my kids, everyone, that thing just got work, you know, like everyone was making hot dogs. And then uh, like the next year they're like, Hey, we want to go to family day. Like, well, I got bad news for you. That machine is gone. <laughs> like, somebody must have gotten sick because uh, it's not there anymore. Like, oh, we don't want to go then. <laughs> like, oh, well, don't you want to go see this or that? Nah. The museum's new. Nah, we don't want to go. Nice. We just, just want to go for the hot dog machine. Nice. So let's, um, I want to set up something from your hypersonic work real quick to now dive into what I think you and your brother are doing with this program. I'm making this this guess here. And I also think it's fascinating. So I think we should also recognize it's Fatia, Fatia Hardy, right? And Amber Capello are here from your office that are super great, both of them that helped set this up. Um, and they sent me some things to watch. And I always do my homework. So I watched them and I loved it because on, let's see, it was March 13th, 2019. You get called into the Secretary of the Army's office. And this is why I always wish I had kind of worked in the military, because I like managers like this or leaders like this, where they say, hey, guess what? You have, uh, to the beginning of FY23, uh, Lieutenant Thurgood, or Major General Thurgood at the time, right. to uh, deliver hypersonic capability. What are your questions? <laughs> like that. Yes. And, the, you know, and then looking at um, some other articles, like I found this one in Military News, here we are in June of that year and you're close to picking a web like a a uh, vendor if you will to help with the weapon right right so i'm like wow march april March. that's not too much time so boom you go right to work and i think a lot of 
I'm assuming your experience that you kind of had leading that and directed energy or whatever impossible tasks, arguably impossible tasks were levied on you, I think are kind of the, the building blocks and foundation to what you and your brother are doing now in this program at UAH. Is that, is that accurate? Yeah, I think there's lots of ties there that are, that will go and feed this program. Um, so when the secretary asked me, we actually asked me in February, we had to until March to go back with a plan. Um, I, I've been a really kind of uh, blessed or lucky in my, in my career uh, that I've been given lots of opportunities to do new things. Mm-hmm. Uh, lot, stood up lots of new offices over, over my career. Um, and, and that the RICTA was one of those new offices to do very specific things. Yeah. When, when our nation, despite whatever problems we might have as a nation, one thing is for sure about America of many things. One of them is when we want to do a thing and we're focused on a thing, America will find a way to make that thing happen. Mm -hmm. You go back to the space program, you go back to the missile programs, go back to, it, just many examples of that, how we came together after 9-11, how, how we come together when times are hard, we'll figure out a way to do that. The, we were successful um, in getting speed with that program because the secretary needed it to be done for our nation. When you're in a fight, you don't want to go there un, undermanned, undergunned. Um, I, I used to say all the time, you know, if you're going to go to the fight, you're going to bring a knife, I'm going to bring a gun. You bring a gun, I'm bringing a tank. You bring mm-hmm. a tank, I'm bringing the Air Force. Um, in in the fight, the you want to have as much opportunity for success as you can because there's no guarantees in combat that, that you're coming home. Yeah. And our young men and young women of this nation who have paid that price over and over through our history uh, are testament to that outcome. Um and hypersonics is one of those things where our adversaries were ahead of us and we needed to move at a different pace, a different way, a different approach um, to move at speed. Um, and the secretary, the chief of staff of the Army, the secretary of the Navy, chief of staff of the Navy, and my good friend, um, Vice Admiral Johnny Wolf, was my battle buddy in the, on the Navy side. We, were, mm-hmm. we were, had worked together previously in an MDA, just a great partner in how we – able to accelerate that and and um but through that process of of leading soldiers you know for half of my career and then moving to leading high complex thinkers high end engineers uh for a large part of my career really taught me a lot about leadership and taught me a a lot about some of the gaps that we as a, a nation and that we as an organization called the department of defense and any any industry and I saw the same thing in the industry, um, uh, how we teach engineers to become leaders. Mm-hmm. Um, if you, and I'll just use UH as an example. I've had this conversation with President Carr. Uh, I've had it with conversations with, uh, with Dr. Green on the business side. If you go to the business school at, at UAH and get a, a MBA or an undergraduate degree in MBA, and you go, okay, well, where are you going to want, want to work? 75% of the folks that graduate from UH stay right here in the Huntsville area. It's a high complex area, hmm. high complex thinkers. And you go, well, how many classes on engineering management did you have? Or how many classes on basic engineering thought processes did you have? And the answer will be none. And then you go to the engineering school and you go, okay, great. Uh, let's talk about a, a PhD engineer who's got a, PhD in astrophysics or PhD in, in some high end technology. And eventually as they go in their careers, they are going to become leaders. The gap is that we've never educated them to become leaders. Mm -hmm. So how many classes did your average PhD have on decision-making on, on how to run an office, how to manage, how to lead? And the answer is none. It those those classes don't exist. Yeah. And so um, and, and I noticed that uh, as a leader, how you lead is highly tied to who you're leading. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I, I'm not a fan of checklist leadership. You do these 16, 16 things, you'll be a great leader. I, I'm no. the, I don't believe in that philosophy. Right. Uh, I believe in situational leadership. Sometimes you have to be compassionate. 
you, you have to be empathetic. Mm-hmm. Sometimes you, you have to jack some people up. Um, sometimes you have to be a little more directive. Uh, it depends on the audience. But if you look at our engineers, and I'll just use engineers as a, an example, if you look at their career, it's like an hourglass. And it's the same in the government. It's the same in industry. Um, we bring students out of school who have high, complex, great GPAs in some engineering discipline. And we bring them in because we want them to do that disciplinary engineering work, whether it's double E's, electronic engineers, mechanical engineers, astro engineers, whatever engineer discipline it is. And they're great at it, and they're brilliant at it. And then, and, and so we give them a workspace, and they go to work. And then pretty soon, they're so good at it, we're like, we want you to be in charge of three engineers. Right. And, and so they start moving up the corporate ladder because they were great at the thing we hired them to do, engineer work. But we've never trained them to think that way. The system engineering V is not a decision-making process for leaders. <laughs> That's an engineering process. And so what happens is if you want to get pulled through the center of the hourglass and become a corporate leader as an engineer, then there has to be some mechanism to teach you how to think as a corporate leader. Yeah. And, and that is the focus of this, this effort. Um, you know, as, as Keith, my older brother and I, you know, as, as he was, and when he became a one star, I was a, a, a Lieutenant Colonel on active duty and he was a one star in the reserves we both started our doctoral programs. And of course, like good brothers, we had a competition. And of course, to this day, I still let him know that I finished first. Uh, but it took us quite a while, uh, both in the same discipline, kind of like you had mentioned with your brother earlier, mm-hmm. uh, both in a dis- discipline of leadership and strategy and organizational behavior and how all that works. Uh, very fast, very, very interesting uh, area of study. When you combine that with what we know about engineers and how we train and teach engineers and how we train and teach corporate leaders, then you begin to go, there's, there's got to be a way that we, we put an academic institution in place or a course in place that teaches engineers the leadership skills they need to get through the hourglass so they can get up into the corporate leadership. Um, Now you have to recognize right up front that not all engineers want to do that. Mm-hmm. Like some engineers want to be engineers. That's what they love. That's their passion. Uh, and some of them want to, to expand into the leadership management role. And so, and so as we talked about this with, with Dr. Green, with Fatia and Amber, with all the team, the engineering team at UAH, uh, we began to think we, we, we should create uh, a mechanism that provides very creative, very innovative very direct mechanisms, tools that you can come and learn and then practice. Yeah. Um, and, and that's what we've, we, we've put together an, an idea of how to, how to help n- not just engineers, but um, how do we help high complex thinkers, super smart individuals, rocket scientists, literally here yeah. in this area, how to think about how to think about leadership and management a little bit different as they, if they choose to to go on a path, a career path that is outside the engineering domain. Let me ask you this. This is, um, I don't know, this is just your commentary on something, but I'd always heard for anybody that was a, you know, government employee, they got frustrated that they had to go into management in order to get promoted, you know, and ultimately to have a better retirement and such, right? And, you know, to to a certain degree, is that kind of, is that something that the bigger government all agencies need to address that, you know, maybe some people just need to stay in the engineering route and be able to be promoted up and, and retire as a GS 15 and not be forced to, Hey, sorry, if you want to be a 14, you need to start getting into management. Well, maybe they're not very good. Cause then guess what? You end up getting, uh, you know, tasked with 200 contractors and you don't know what to do. That's right. And then decisions aren't made cause you're uncomfortable and you just can't wait to get put into your other assignment. And it's like, what are we doing here? Yeah, that's a, it's a really great point and a great a great question. Uh, I'll just I'll address it in two ways. The first is that the Army has begun to recognize this. When General Convo was the chief of staff of the Army, he recognized that, look, there are some folks who, who are going to be great engineers. They're not going to be great tank drivers. Yeah. Let's let them stay in the engineering world <laughs> and let them be successful. Right. Um, 
and the and the government civilians are being, beginning to recognize the same thing. Traditionally, it has been an up or out system, right? Mm-hmm. You you get promoted and and keep moving up, or we or you move you know into retirement. I, I think we're beginning to recognize, and I would say corporate uh, corporations are beginning to do the same recognition that that you can be successful and help a company, help a nation, help an office, help an, an organization and be in the niche that you're in. If that's what you want to do, if that's the thing you're good at and you want to do, yeah. then we should find a way to help people do that. Um, what you have to recognize as the individual who makes that choice on the other side of the coin is that there is a limit to what you can do and what your future could be. Mm-hmm. And so there, there's two sides to that argument. The argument that says, I want to be here and create a, a, a condition in my organization that I can be here my whole career. Yeah. By the way, other militaries in the world do that. Other organizations in the world do that. You can stay at that in that position. That's because that's what you love to do. Or, but realize that if you decide to do that, then these other opportunities are not going to be available to you. Right. So you, so there's two sides of that that have to be recognized and the individual has to own that decision, not the organization. The individual does. Yeah. And if we can do that, then we have a really chance to help the people that want to be engineers. They want to, that's all they want to do their whole life. Then let them do that. Let them be great engineers. We need them. And there'll be some engineers that we need to lead high engineering organizations. Sure. Have you always, uh, been Kenneth Blanchard, right? Is like the father of situational leadership, I believe. But is that something that's been um, always very natural for you, or have you had to kind of evolve and and mature and develop in, in kind of your style and in, in what is now your leadership style and, and the strengths of your leadership style? I, I would say that it has been a road that's been bumpy and and mm. rough. I, I I think that that. The School of Hard Knocks is a great teacher, <laughs> and and I've been fortunate to have some great leaders around me that have taught me and mentored me. I'll give you one example, if that's okay. Sure. It's your show, man. <laughs> <laughs> one of the greatest leaders I've ever met is is um, was my battalion commander uh, in uh, when I was flying in special operations. Okay. Uh, Jeff Slosher is his name. Just a great American. Still dear friends to this day. Okay. He retired as a two star, and on a particular event we were on, um, I was I was uh, my job was to lead the the soldiers on the ground with refueling and rearming points so that our aircraft could come in and get refueled and rearmed to go back into the fight. And uh, we were it was just a practice. We were just practicing for the mission, and uh, we we jumped in airborne into the uh, into our location our position, and. And we had one of our soldiers break his leg on a jump, and and we did all the right medical things and got him out. And we're setting the FARP up, and and it's a highly timed event. No no communications. It's all based on time and events. Did you say FARP? Yeah, FARP, Forward Arming Refueling Point. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks. I for... needed that. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> and uh, I'd been awake for a couple of days, and uh, and something happened on the aircraft side that made the timing on our side not work. Hmm. And and at a certain time we were gonna burn our equipment and walk home. That was the plan, and that and that time was coming. And so I had all my soldiers gather all the equipment to the center. We're getting ready to burn it so we can leave and not leave any trace behind. And I hear a Chinook coming in 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 the wind, and I'm like, oh thank goodness, <laughs> I don't have to destroy this equipment. And uh, they came and picked us up, and we landed. And when we landed, Jeff Slosher met me at the aircraft. So I'm a captain. He's the battalion commander, lieutenant colonel. Okay. And I don't know what I was thinking. It was a terrible choice. And I remember walking off the aircraft. I'd been, I hadn't slept or ate for a couple of days. And uh, I, said to Je- I said to Colonel Slosher at the time, I said, sir, you got to tell me what's going on. Uh, well, you left us out there. I was not happy. And a few other things I probably shouldn't have said. <laughs> and and by every right and standard, he should have just smoked me right where I stood. He should have just taught me a great lesson mm-hmm. and smoked me right there. But he taught me a greater lesson. 
he literally put his arm around my shoulder in a very, very calm, soft voice. He said these words. I'll never forget it. He said, Neil, go get some sleep, get some food. We'll talk about it later. And he walked away. And that lesson was situational leadership. Hmm. We had been in a tough situation for a few days. He knew it. He knew it didn't go well. He knew that I was frustrated. The team was frustrated. Our soldiers were frustrated. And I was out of line, and he could have and should have probably smoked me. Mm. But he chose a leadership style that, for me, was perfect. And and later, we had a, I learned some more things from him <laughs> after I got some food and some sleep. <laughs> <laughs> but it was a great, a great. Uh, lesson for me in leadership. And I, and I've been blessed with leaders like that my whole career. And I've tried to be that kind of leader for the, the soldiers that, that have been my responsibility. Yeah. I used to, um, a lot of times I, uh, sometimes you have to train, like, you know, I, I took a lot of classes in management and leadership stuff. Right. And there's, there's sometimes that interesting dynamic between your contracting workforce and then the, the, the customer you're supporting and and whatever their level of, of um, training had been, if you will. And there's a lot of times, you know, I, you manage a big program or whatever, and government chief comes in and just gives you some bad news or like a very tough situation, complex. And, and there's always kind of like, you know, never just go to the car lot and buy the car, like sleep on it, right? Like, what, do you, what are we going to do? I'm like, I'll, I'll be back here first thing in the morning. But just, I just need some time. Because I'm not going to just sit here and, you know, rammer and stammer through. Let's just let's just go home. Let's get a good night's sleep, and and uh, we'll be ready to dress this in the morning. But you know, I just I just need to, I just need to go away right now. You know, and go <laughs> run and just think and process. You know, like we'll solve it, but just need a little bit of time. Well, sometimes I think <laughs> as as a leader, I think that approach is really good. Again, it depends on the situation, yeah. right? Sometimes there's a saying in the army like first reports are always wrong. Mm. So you got to get the information, understand the information, uh, react the best you can to it. And sometimes the best thing, as you just indicated, is, look, let's take a knee, take a breath. Yeah. Let, let's just walk away and come back in a few minutes or an hour or a day later and, and talk about it. Depending on the situation, you may have that kind of time. Yeah. And sometimes in, in, in sometimes you don't. Sometimes you don't have that much time to, to do it. And sometimes you have time to explain to your team what's, why you're making the decision. And sometimes you don't have time to explain to your team. Yeah. Um, but I think, uh, you know, those those examples are um, – I'll give you one other one other quick story uh, on the hypersonic side that you mentioned earlier. Er, early on, there were lots of people who thought we couldn't get as far as we did. And we got that far because the team was super great. They were phenomenal rocket scientists making all this happen on both the government side, the Navy side, Army side – industry side everybody was focused because our nation needed an outcome Mm -hmm. and general rash is doing a super job of of finishing that mission set uh, for our nation along with vice admiral wolf Um, but on one particular mission uh, we were we were doing a a flight test and the flight test didn't go very well Um, some things happened and i remember sitting with my team in the command center watching this mission happen in real time and i remember uh, um, stopping the mission, stopping the missile in flight because it, it wasn't behaving the way it needed to behave. And just as you said, <laughs> once the missile was taken care of, everybody was safe. I walked out of that command center, walked outside, took a breath and walked back in and the whole team is in there waiting. <laughs> <laughs> what to do now? What are we going to do? What's Thurgood going to say? And I, re- I remember I remember the Jeff Slosher lesson and, and I walked back in the team and I told them how proud I was of them for what they did and how far we'd gotten. I, I did not focus on the fact that we, we had a bunch of work to do. Um, and hopefully those kind of lessons will help a, a young engineer become a great engineer and a great engineer become even better. Yeah. Realizing that, that when you're trying to do things fast and different, you're going to make some mistakes. Um, you mentioned earlier in the RCCTO, uh, we had a bunch of, everybody thinks that we just did hypersonics and directed energy. We had about 88 programs. And our job was to, 
to try to do it really, really, relatively fast and prove that it either worked or didn't work. It was not our job to build a bunch of them. That was that's what PEOs do. Mm -hmm. The job of the RICTO is to get to a prototype, which is which is defined as a combat unit set of equipment. Not just trying one thing, but a combat set of equipment. Yeah. And and I often told the team, uh, as I as the secretary, when he asked me to do the job, I said, Sir, some of the things we're gonna do aren't gonna work. You got you gotta just know that when you're trying to be inventive, you're trying to innovation, you're trying to innovation at pace, that it's not gonna work and 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 when I, when I left that command, I told the team that, I, and I believe this with all my heart, I was just as proud of the things that we stopped and killed as the things that we gave to the soldiers because we knew that it was not good enough to give to the soldiers at the time. Yeah. So you have to realize in leadership that it, it, you got to cover the good with the bad. It, it's not, a, not every day is your, your rosy sunglasses day, but you've got to – that's a skill that you have to be taught coming back to where you started. Right. Yeah. You, you learn that and, and you get a chance to be around great leaders and you get a chance to, to be around great subordinates who understand what you want to do and be successful with that. Um, and, and that's what this course we're trying to put together is all about. How do you build that kind of vision for your team? How do you bring that together when, when your, your whole life has been, you know, slide rules and calculators and high-end engineering skills. How do we then tie those and link those together to leadership skills? So let's talk. Let's uh, let's transition in and bring it up and talk about the course. Um, you've already run it once. Correct? No, you no, haven't this, run it this at will all. Be our first, our first course. Okay, maybe I was looking at some other dates. So the dates are March twenty-sixth to the twenty-eighth. My understanding is the first two days are kind of academic lectures, and then on the last day you're going to Lidos for kind of an on-site learning day. Yeah, so so we uh, we believe, uh, and most um, and the folks at UAH believe we we believe that there's an academic piece to learning and a, a get your hands and go see kind of learning. Yeah, uh, so that we've designed the course uh, with Patia's help and Amish help, the whole team's help, but. Sometimes people say, well, Keith and Neil did this. That's not really what happened, right? It's a group of people. <laughs> and, uh, and there's some great instructors that are, that are lined up to help us, help us be successful. And the thing is, if he doesn't mention that, then you're going to lose your team. Well, right? if, it's just, if it's just... It's not because I'm going to lose it, it's because it's true. <laughs> <laughs> I've worked for people like that, where they take all the credit. And you're like, seriously, dude? Like, what about us? <laughs> Look, I, I spent my whole life in the Army. I don't think about how to make a class. <laughs> they know how to make a class. <laughs> there you go. Um, and so, um, so we'll, we'll, we'll bring in some great instructors that, that, are, that are already part of the UAH team. Uh, Keith and I won't actually do much of the on-hands instructing. Um, um, that's, that's not the, the kind of the role that we play in this. We'll be there to help help work through some of it and help give some practical experience um, in addition to what the instructors will already do. But the idea is to get exposure to ideas and get exposure to how that idea happens in the real world. Um, one of the reasons that if you were to talk, talk to Keith and I, one of the reasons that we got our PhDs um, my, our, in business, DBAs actually, is as a young student, I, I became very frustrated with instructors. And then when I got into the master's programs, I got very frustrated with instructors who, who spent their whole world in academics mm -hmm. and, and could articulate the theories and the ideas and the, all that masterfully. But they had no practical experience in how to actually do that on the ground. Yeah. And, and at some point, you know, in my third career or fourth career, whatever, whatever it is, that's, that's really what I want to do is, is I want to be one of those old professors with the elbow patches. <laughs> <laughs> that guy. That has both academic experience and practical experience. Sure. And, and just spend, spend time teaching, teaching the great, I'll just say the youth of America, you know, this great, this great country we live in, how to, you know, what, what might be useful. Yeah. I remember... I, w I did my undergrad at George Mason University in Virginia, and I got so mad at I had this like marketing class, and it's kind of one of those marketing professors that that's all you know. He got his PhD in something, was an assistant associate professor, and then became a professor tenure, and that's all he's ever done. 
and sometimes they just refuse to consider your idea. So me, I, I like to drink a lot of soda, <laughs> right? And I'm th- we were having a you know, marketing class and we we're discussing like fast food chains or something. And I kind of rose my hand. And I said, you know what? I feel like people will make a determination on where they eat based on do they carry Coke or Pepsi? And he's like, that's nonsense. He he slaughtered my <laughs> idea. I'm like, I think I I think I'm onto something here, <laughs> you know. And then I remember a few years later, I've seen it like several times where um, studies have been done where people like I I go to Taco Bell because I eat the tacos whenever, and I'll tolerate the fact that it's Pepsi. But everyone loves McDonald's because they have the best Coke mixture and the best Diet Coke mixture and all this kind of stuff. Like, but the guy just like couldn't get his head out of the sand. That there's like this alternate idea out there, you know, and you know, you my, know. my wife is like you. She, yeah. she knows every restaurant and what yeah. they serve, and and she is definitely in her. That's in her decision cycle. <laughs> my mom will. She had a head injury, so some of just that she will eviscerate that poor server if if they don't have Dr Pepper. <laughs> she will go like crazy, and it's very embarrassing. Mom, you need to you need to calm down. They don't have Dr Pepper. Why don't they have doc? They just don't. They have chosen to. Like, we have this for 40 something years now. We've had this discussion. You know, the, I'll, I'll just link this if I could. Yeah. Uh, one of Dr. Carr's areas of emphasis as, as our president uh, has been the, the involvement of UH in the community. Sure. And so the number of interns that are on the campus that, that are in industry, that are on Redstone, the professors that are starting to reach out. And, and get out of the classroom and, and, and be involved in helping businesses think through the great things they know and, and kind of starting to mix that academic and, and experience together. Um, and, and you can't get that experience in any other community like you can in Huntsville. Mm-hmm. Given the engineering business and all the colleges, music included, all, all the colleges, and the, the relationship in the community – and the things that this community can do between the cultural part of, of, you know, the VBC, the Orion mm-hmm. theaters, the, the sports stuff, the, in, the medical things, the industry things, there is a lots of things that, that can strengthen the relationship between the community at large and, and the academic part of education. Yeah. Do you want to um, talk? Let's, I want to now like really any, of the takeaways or, or high points you want to hit. Certainly when we get down to transformance and enterprise leadership, I want to make sure that you hit whatever you want on this as, uh, and, and as well, I think people knowing that, Hey, ask your employer to help pay for this. Yeah. You know, I know there's things like leadership greater Huntsville that are, that have about the same price tag that people do that I'm sure their employees are paying for. And it's awesome to see on LinkedIn those cohorts that just, Oh, this was an outstanding experience. I think it's going to be the same for you all. Right. Oh, what a blessing to be a part of the UAH's program with the third goods. And it's changed my trajectory, but I really want to make sure that we hit whatever you want on here. Yeah. So just a couple of points Um, that the idea of, of this transformation of leadership is what this is all about. Right. Begin to think a new way, a different way and putting that together in some kind of practical way. The course just isn't the three days, right? The course is the prep work you do to get there. Mm. It's the three days to apply it, and then it's the post work. You know, how do we follow up? How do we, how do we help um, folks think through a mentoring program, and how do we help them think through not just the three days? The, the three days is really the takeaway is here are some tools. Yeah. As a situation leader, which ones work in your organization? Which gotcha. ones don't work in your organization? Um, and and so that's really the the heart and soul of it. Uh, to, to move forward. Um, there, there are lots of leadership models out there. Mm-hmm. Uh, there are lots of books on leadership. I probably read most of them, if not all of them. Uh, I'm, I'm a big fan of, of reading. Um, and so the idea is not to do, say, do these six things. The idea is these are the things in yeah. this situation you should consider. This is how you transform an organization. These are the tools you have to do that. Um, it's not do these 16 things. That's not really the, the construct that, that, that we believe is a successful construct. Um, and if you can, if you can find a way to filter information to you and how you personally filter information in the situation you're in, then you'll apply the right tools for that situation. And so that's, that's really what it's about. 
at the end, at the end of the day, leadership leaders are going to be measured on are they successful in the thing they've been asked or told to do. Um, there's you can't escape that. That is that is what they the outcome that leaders design designed for, and and how you get there is makes a difference. Mm-hmm. And so that's what this course is all about. So what's the when it comes down to what you bring and what your brother Keith Keith right? Yes. I keep wanting to call you Lane. You're not related <laughs> to Lane. I know Elaine Thurgood. And I just keep wanting to insert his name in here. Um, what is it that you feel? What's what is like your core capability, your your strength area, and versus what he brings? If that makes sense. Yeah. So it's it's a good question. Um, and Keith's got some great strength. You know, he he works uh, already in the, in the academic world. He's he's been doing it for a long time. Okay. Uh, he he has much more experience in that world. Than and he's I at do. University of Texas. At, at University of Texas in Dallas. Okay. Um, he lives in Plano, Texas. He better not be a Cowboys fan. I, I don't is think he, a he is. Fan? I don't know. Thank God. I don't know about that. <laughs> I'm um, kidding. But he's got lots of academic experience, uh, and so he is he's really at the level of of Fatih and Amber and the team of, you know, how the whole college thing works. Okay. You know, I'm an advisor to the president. I'm not, a, I'm not an academic person. I'm not an, you know, I'm not an instructor. I'm not a, any of those kind of things. Um, and so he's, he has some expertise that I clearly, I don't have that he, he has in spades. Yeah. We, we've been taught very similarly in the military leadership style. And and we and we'll both pull from that, and then we'll both pull from our experiences of working with the industry, of working with government, uh, non-military, mm-hmm. um, and so, um, and I and I have a lot of experience in that domain, working with industry and how industry works and how industry trains and builds leaders, and so, we think there's a pretty good balance there between the great background that he has and hopefully the things that that I can bring to the table, and then and then our other instructors that are also on the web page, yeah. Um, hand selected Fatih and the team hand selected those folks to help us be successful. That's Jason, Julie, and yeah. Tom. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, we we've met uh, several times. They're great. They are experts in their domains. I mean, they they are literally are subject matter experts. Um, and again, they'll bring to the table the things and the gaps that Keith and I can't bring to the table. Yeah. And so, um, and that's why I said earlier. The, the value of this is the team that's doing this. It's not one of us that's going to make the big difference. Sure. S- success is if if an engineer can walk away with one or two ideas, one or two things like, oh, that, that could make a difference for me. Yeah. Let me practice that tool. Let me use that tool. That's success. We're not going to – success is not somebody walking out of this course and becoming the CEO <laughs> or, or becoming a great leader overnight. I, I don't believe in that kind of outcome. Yeah. What I believe is here are some things that that are tools that can be used, and, and here are some ways you can think about applying those tools in the situation that you're in. Yeah. You know, um, I want to set up a point here about entrepreneurship. Let me, and let me just say this, and I didn't realize this till I used to work for the National Counterterrorism Center, so that, which became um, NCTC, which then uh, was a program under DNI. So, you know, post-9-11, see ya. And um, so we were working with like MI6 and stuff over there in um, in the UK. And I'm a contractor, and I had this really cool job, and I'm traveling over there. And we were uh, we were working with the Four Eyes Nations. It wasn't the Five Eyes at the time. It was right, Australia, right. Canada, us, and uh, and Britain. When it came to what we were doing for counterterrorism, New Zealand was at the time wasn't a part of it. So, um, and it's interesting when you start getting to travel a little bit and penetrate other governments, you know, and you could start comparing your experience to their experience. Right. And you start looking at the age of some of their computer rooms or whatever, or their buildings they're in. You're like, Oh my goodness. I thought GSA was bad back <laughs> home. Like this is really bad. But, um, so we're talking, we had like this major problem that we were trying to solve and it's difficult at times. Now it's one thing within your own, the army, to solve a problem, right? Then let then the bigger military versus right. like just countries and everyone's trying to protect their equities. I like transparency. I know that's a big part of what one of your pillars, right? right? It's just being transparent. But anyway, um, we one day this guy, one of the Brits, his name was Sean. We kind of became friends. We can't. We're not. We're not allowed to be friends, right? But um, we were allies. And he said, "You know, Troy, I love working with the U.S. because." 
you guys are just entrepreneurial. Like if you see a problem, you just go, you figure out how to fix it. And there's no real like, uh, like lanes you have to stay in. He's like, we can't like, we have this problem, but the only reason we're able to address it right now is because you guys are here and, and, you know, kind of helping to force it. And then we start getting the attention of management, but I can't just go to MOD, you know, ministry of defense and say, Hey, I've got this problem. I need your help. They can't. They're like we're not. Not structured to do that. Like ideas don't. Or not, they're not allowed to go up. They'll, they have to come down. Have to be someone else's thing. And and so that's the only r- reason we're able to do this this project is because you all have helped us to go start it from the top and filter down. And so sometimes I think of like entrepreneurship of oh you're building this new widget whatever it's all about sales and capitalism and stuff. But exactly what you're doing here, right? Here's this UAH. Okay, and we kind of talked about a little bit earlier. Maybe it's ebbed and flowed a little bit with its connection with Redstone. Okay, let's, um, Dr. Carr, whoever has this idea at UAH. Hey, let's bring in uh, retired Lieutenant General Thurgood to help us out. Hey, we want you to do this thing. You know what? My brother's in Texas, at, you know, and he, he uh, does some stuff here. Hmm, tell you what, if you give us some resources, but maybe we can build this, you know, let's get... Fatia and Amber to help us, and let's get Jason and and then the I, you know what I mean, right? And it's like we're all over the map here. So we've brought in University of Texas, we got Huntsville, we've got whatever is needed in order to accomplish something. And you kind of touched on it earlier, like, hey, if we put our minds to it in this country, we do it, right? And that's like, and I've seen that play out so many times. And sometimes I think people forget that even in in just programs like this. This is that entrepreneurial spirit. Like, how do I make this happen? How do I tap into my network? How do I ask for resources to make it happen? Yeah, I think that, I think it's a really good point, Troy. It, you know, a, a piece of this um, is is being able to understand the personal risk you have associated with it. Yeah. Right. The professional risk you have associated with it. Some people don't like that. They mm-hmm. they like to be comfortable. They they like to be in the to or your point earlier. They like to be what they're doing. Yeah. Um, if the organization doesn't, to your point about the MOD, if the organization doesn't encourage it, then it won't happen, right? It just won't happen. Mm-hmm. Um, you, you know, when we, you, you look at some of these, these companies that are, that are startups, um, that are doing great. I mean, look at, look at, uh, Palmer Lucky who invented the Oculus, yeah, right? The VR that that was willpower and engineering knowledge, yep. just genius in my opinion, and making that happen. And and now now he's part of another company, um, Andrew, which is which is doing great. There's companies like that that are that if you have a passion for what you're doing and mm-hmm. you have the willpower to not put up with the standard status quo, then you can be successful. Um, and sometimes you won't be. And, and you just got to keep pushing, right? Look, yeah. Look at the great leaders uh, that, I mean, look at Churchill. If yeah. you look at the first part of his career, I'm like, oh, I don't know about that. <laughs> <laughs> Abraham Lincoln is another great example, Yeah. right? Look at all the all the failures that brought him to where he was. And and I certainly in my own career had moments where I had needed a, a Jeff Slosher to put his arm on my shoulder and go, okay, look, take a breath. <laughs> what happened wasn't that great. We'll talk about it later. Um and so I think that idea of of encouraging that behavior, that entrepreneurship that you're talking about, is really, really important. And, and you will find, I found over my my career, that people will appreciate the ability to try a thing, knowing that it might not work, and they won't get shot for not letting it work. Yeah, I was kind of thinking. I don't know if this. I love sports analogies. Um, and I don't know if this if this is something that if you use sports analogies and sometimes in your classrooms, but I think of like uh, remember the Titans and or Hoosiers. Yeah, yeah. And there's two good scenes in each of those where, well, remember the Titans. You know, you have a defender and this or this offensive guy, Petey. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And he's an offensive guy, right? And they and they they realized on defense they're getting crushed by this like number twenty three, who's running all over them. And so they're like, Hey, Petey, you're gonna start playing defensive back. And you're going to guard this guy. He's like, well, I don't play defense. He's like, you know, I don't know the defense. It doesn't matter. All you have to do is focus on number 23. And you just follow him everywhere you go. And remember the same thing in Hoosiers. 
yep. where a coach is like, hey, you just got to guard that guy. And by the end of the game, I want to know what kind of chewing gum he chews. <laughs> That's all you have to do, you know, is just defend him. And I think sometimes if people just say, hey, just start small, right? In leadership, whatever it is, or don't get too concerned in the outcomes and stuff. Just take it one step at a time. Yeah. And I don't know if those are some of the principles that might get baked in, but, and it's just not as overwhelming. Yeah. You know, I, to that individual. It, it is, uh, you know, you move, you move forward one step at a time, as you said. As a leader, though, you have the responsibility to see where the series of steps are going to take you. Yeah. Right. You got to see out there far enough that the individual daily steps will get you on that path realizing that it may not be as straight as you want it to be. <laughs> yeah. It may be a little bit curvy. There may be some stumbling and falling along the way, but you, you've got to set that condition. Um, and in setting that condition of what success looks like means also accepting that it doesn't work along the path, right? And helping people understand that. Um, I, I think people... People want to know what success is in their life. Um, they want to know what success in their profession, in their organization, in their job looks like. I was having a conversation about this today. That that what does success look like in, in a particular organization, and then how do how do we define that success, and how do we help them get to that successful point? Yeah. Um, that uh, when, when sometimes when you we get overwhelmed when all we see is the end state. And we go, oh, here's the 16,000 things I have to do. Just like in, a, in the football game or the basketball game you mentioned. Look, just get through the next minute. <laughs> just defend him on the next play. Yeah. And then do it again on the next play after that. And the next play after that. Pretty soon the game's over. Yeah. And, and you've, done, you've done what you need to do for the team. Um, and in, in both of those cases, particularly in the case of Petey, I remember that scene in the movie. <laughs> it is also the idea that that where you start may not be where you finish. Yeah. Right. Where you started and in, in what you thought you could bring to the table, the team may need something different from you. And you have to be able to flex to that, just like Petey did in that movie. Yeah. You know, I don't know if you know Thad Forrester. He's over in Hampton Cove. His brother was, Mark was killed in action. Mm. Jag 28. Um, he's a, um, he's a member as well. Um, in your stake. But anyway, he and I actually were talking the other day, like about he actually was here. He has his own podcast. I had him as a guest. Um, it'll appear later. Um, he was sitting like right there. Actually, I think it was New Year's Eve, maybe. But anyway, we were talking about coaching youth sports, and I was telling him when my son was in eighth grade, I coached his youth basketball team, and I'm one of those kind of people. Like, look, it's eighth grade. If they win the championship great but at the same it's it shouldn't define that kid's life right, right and guess what no one really cares outside of the 200 people that may have been in the gym it's not that important and so we were talking about i was telling him like in the league i coached in we got it was very well organized you got four basketballs from the league it was very uniform it was kind of like nascar like <laughs> as far as like uniformity right right you all get four basketballs Everyone gets two hours a week in practice, and you're going to use a half court of this gym. So, you know, you're practicing at the same time as another team. And then we go to uh, your game. And it's not like, you know, there's some team that's going to get an unfair advantage. Right. And so this other team, the Demons, always practice near us. And only like six or seven of their 10 kids would show up for practice. There was always somebody missing out, if not two or three of them. And their coach, all they did was run plays and run plays and run plays. And ultimately, they won the championship. But I said, you know what? I think we were more successful. Because even though I didn't always like it, all 10 of my guys showed up every single practice. Right. Because we had fun. You know, it wasn't just about, like, we're trying to win this thing. There's kids who got a pressure from dad and other sports, lacrosse or football. You're going to be something one day. And they just, basketball was something they enjoyed because they had some friends. And they just wanted to have fun. I said, you know, I think we were pretty successful. We finished very average, middle of the road. When, you right, know, right. Lost our first playoff game, season's over. But I think I got a lot of good feedback from the parents, and they had a good experience. Like, so ultimately, what's more important? That's right. Right? That, you know, all coaches will say, oh, we're going to, you know, you're going to learn something. And then somehow they kind of lose their mind, and they get <laughs> so focused on the stupid championship. Like, I thought we were supposed to develop these boys to become men and have good experiences that hopefully later in life they draw upon 
You know, yeah. sports taught me all these things. And, and that's your opportunity as a coach to provide that to those boys or yeah. girls, whatever, whoever you're coaching. Yeah, I think that's it's really interesting point, Troy. Some coaches think and and uh, we are marshals, a really good example of this. You remember in, in the theater or they're in the chapel in that movie, the one scene there in the chapel and and the, the new coach is with the, the coach that was there when the plane crashed. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And it, and. And he said, you know, I've said it a thousand times for myself. The only thing that matters is winning. Mm-hmm. <laughs> the only thing that matters is winning. And and uh, I think it's Matthew McConaughey that's playing that part. I might have that wrong. I'm not very good with movies. But but he followed up. He goes, maybe this year it only matters that we play. Mm. Right? That's it, right. It only matters this year that we play. And it was a very powerful message uh, about – what you're describing, I would put in the world of situational leadership. Mm-hmm. He, that team needed something different that year, and maybe the next year, and maybe the next year. And he recognized that. And he recognized that everything he thought was true, th- right now at that moment in time was not true in, in sense of what the team needed. Yeah. And I think that's a very powerful thing. Uh, you know, our, our two daughters played sports. They played in sports in high school, fast pitch softball here in Alabama. When, when we were here in Alabama and they did it because it was fun. And I knew they were never going to be collegiate athletes. That yeah. was not going to be their future. Yeah. And, and so I didn't really worry about winning, whether the team won or lost. I worried about did they learn a few valuable principles Did they enjoy and build good friends. Yeah. That they're still with friends today. Um, I, yeah. I think that recognition is really important that you're describing. My, are we good? You guys need a drink or restroom break or anything? I'm I'm good. Thanks. My uh my one son that broke like, he broke all his bones in wrestling, right? He also ran cross country. Now he's not a runner, but it was his his friends were runners, right? But they enjoyed having him along, and he was like, and he would he would still work hard and, and would practice. He just wasn't like gifted as a runner. And uh, I've told this to story before. But we went it was right before we moved here. We go to the University of um, it was NC State. Like they had something with Nike, and they have this big cross country meet that kind of follows everybody's. Um, you know, the state tournaments are over, and now you kind of go into these invitationals and just kind of the the the, the champion. Um, you know, like the invitational season kind of starts up, right, right. And a lot of these runners will come from wherever to to NC State, and uh, <laughs> I asked them like, "Hey, what's your PR?" And now again, like some of these kids are trying to race to to win the whole thing on his team, and. He's like, well, I don't know. Like, these are just five Ks, right? Right. He's right. like, oh, I think it's like twenty-two minutes. I'm like, hmm. I'll tell you what. And I've never done. I've done this once with one of my other sons. I said, I'll give you five hundred dollars cash if you can break twenty minutes. Basically, take two minutes off your PR. I thought my money was safe. <laughs> and we and we go to the team dinner like the night before. Like everybody drives down. We had to stay in a hotel or something. We go to like some you know get a bunch of Italian food and carve up. Right. Right. And all those kids. He's, he's he's not he's the slowest guy in the whole team, and they're wearing pink shorts. You know they've got this this fun like camaraderie thing, and all they cared about was whether or not he was going to be able. They were all coaching him how to shave two minutes off his PR. <laughs> well, you know, and this other guys, you know, they want to finish one, two, three, whatever. But they were just so he had become such a part of the team. Yep. And and guess what? He finished at nineteen fifty six. And he's like, where's the cash? Like, we got to go to the ATM, man. I don't just carry $500 with me. And that's the first thing we did on the way out of town. Beautiful. But that's just, uh, and they just all loved it. Everyone was cheering for them. And they were, they had been done for, you know, three or four minutes by now. (laughs) You know, they're drinking sodas and stuff, whatever. And they're waiting for Jason to finish. They'll remember that their whole life. Yeah. Right. Both, all the kids will. Yeah. Right. For that, just that success for that one event. Yeah. Um, Let's see. I was going to ask you. Anything, do you guys touch on anything when it comes to, and obviously you've transitioned now out of almost 40 years of military service, right, into the quote-unquote private sector and consulting and stuff. Is there some of that situational leadership, too, that you touch on? We're like, okay, industry, it means this as you're relating to working for the government or, um, you know what I mean, just kind of the, the different entities and organizations you might represent and then of course then trying to understand where everyone else is coming from yeah yeah i again i put that under the situational piece i'll give you an example you see this i saw this all the time in the government we would go to a company and 
and we would we would want them to make the decision and, and take the approach the government would take. And we would, we would just beat them unmercifully about that. And and I don't know where I, I picked it up or who taught me or where I, I learned it, but what I what I what I told my 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 great officers and government civilians was when you when you come to your first job, go spend sixty days with your with your contractor partner. Hmm. Go to any meeting you want to go to, and if they won't let you call me, I'll get you in the meeting. I, I want you to learn how to win the argument in their structure. I don't want to win the argument from the government structure. Look, we can we can always make the unanimous choice. You're going to do this. That's yeah. never a success. I shouldn't say never. It, it's a difficult outcome. What I want you to do is go learn how they get their decisions made in their company. Who gets to make the decision? What is the cycle of their promotions? I want you to know more about that company than the person that does it. Hmm. And and I want you to win the argument for what you think is right in their structure, in their process, in their decision cycle. Don't walk in there and pound your ass and say, I'm the government. You're going to do it this way. They'll do it for sure, but you'll never get the best effort. You'll get an effort. Yeah. Um, Interesting. So I think you, you, you have to do the, do the same thing uh, in, in situational leadership, right? You, you have to recognize that, you, sometimes you have to be an authoritarian. There, there's no doubt about it. And like I mentioned at the beginning, sometimes you have to be compassionate. All, all of that comes with understanding the environment you're in and how, how does the environment that you're probably not going to change, how do you be successful in that environment? And what approach should you take? And so that will be part of the class is understanding your environment. How do you assess the environment? What are the pros and cons? Is it organized correctly? Can you change it? If you can't change it, how do I become successful in that organization? Yeah. Um, in in uh, in in companies, uh, there's really good examples of this. A lot of successful companies will change organizational structure pretty regularly, on a six month to twelve month kind of basis. It's not because they love change; it's because they recognize that who they are at the beginning of January is not who they are at the end of December. And if they don't recognize that that changes throughout the year, throughout the life of a corporation, throughout the life of an organization, Mm -hmm. throughout the life of the university, then you're not going to be very receptive to other ideas that will come in and provide emphasis and and help you move forward. Does it? I was thinking about this a little bit earlier when I was doing, you know, research, and it's not just specific to you, but. But in thinking about when you met the secretary of the army, this is back like, you know, back in 2019 or 2020. But does that hurt your head at times when someone says, what are we going to be doing in FY 28 or 29 or 30? And you're like, uh, that's like 10 years away. <laughs> you know, like is I mean, and I think that there's going to be, you can have all kinds of discussions around that. There's no sense in, in trying to plan that far out. Well, you probably have to to some degree. But um is that something that's been a challenge for you or in the four leaders is to even forecast out three years, four years? So I, I, I don't think uh, it is a challenge to be sure to answer your question directly, but it's also a responsibility. I, I talked yeah. about this earlier. It, it's not enough to know where you're going this year and next year uh, as a successful leader. You, you've got to be able to, to, to see where you want the organization to be in 2030 or 2035 or 2045. Mm-hmm. In the Army, the Army Modernization Plan that you, we've heard so much about, that wasn't about the Army of today. <laughs> that was about the Army in 2028 and 2030 and 2032. Yeah. And right now, General Rainey, the AFC commander, is working on the Army of 2035 and 2040. What does that look like? Yeah. And then then if, that, if we know what that kind of looks like, and, and, and we're not going to probably get it 100% right, but what, what we can't afford to do is get 100% wrong. True. There, and that's a difference, right? Um, using the, using the, the, the sports analogy, there's a baseball movie. I can't remember who's in it, but it's he was getting taught how to hit the ball, and there was a guy throwing golf balls in front of him. He was trying to hit the golf balls. Mm. And, and the coach said, you need to stop trying to not miss the ball and try to hit the ball. Same kind of thing. Don't worry that it's it's perfectly right out there in 2030. Yeah. Are we on the right path, on the right vector, on the right direction? Because everything between now and then is going to probably change a little bit, and and you have to be open to that change. Um, and I think it, it's the same way in in leading. Yeah. You know what is it? Um, what is it we want to do 
right now, what are we going to do in six months, a year from now, two or three years, right? Because you have to start putting some of those dominoes in place very early, knowing that that you're going to have to adjust this position to get where you want to in the end, to hit the next domino that you need to get to. Yeah. Occasionally, you have to have the moral courage to go, stop. What we thought two years ago was really great, what, based on what we knew at the time. Yeah. Today, it's not good anymore. Kill it. Stop it right now. I, I mentioned earlier, I was just as proud of the things that we, we killed and stopped as I was of the things that we kept going. It, to most people, that seems a very odd statement. But it's a very important construct to realize that the truth, truth is a function of time. In 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 some things, you know, you know, math is math, you know, physics is physics, but information and how you lead changes dramatically. It's a living organism. An organization is the people around it change. What they bring to work today is a different perception than what what they bring a year from now, and you got to be able to to adjust that and see that adjustment happening. Um, if you from 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 our foxhole, if you want to be successful. Let me ask you this. Since you did run utility helicopters, you know, this is now the 50th year since the, the original design of the Blackhawk. Yes. Right? Yes. Uh, we talked about that in 15 Tango, and it was fun learning about Sikorsky was like, it's almost like Nike. If Michael Jordan hadn't come around, Mikey, Nike may not have existed anymore. They were fledgling. And Sikorsky may not have be around had the Blackhawk not kind of saved their business, right? Yes, yes. But um, that's almost 50 years. And so just if you could help me understand, like, inside the Army, and there, and I guess since then, you know, maybe there's some other helicopter. You either had something that was so – now, it's it's uh, it's in its third airframe, right? They went from the Lima to the – Alpha Lima to Mike models. Right, Alpha uh-huh. Lima to Mike. Uh, I know there's progression in that, but are we – when we start talking, like, 20, 10 to 20 years out, I get in the military and in some, you know, the government, you can't just always change on a dime. You know, there's appropriations and there's money. And, and then you also have created this massive tail behind you that's hard to just undo and rip systems out. Right. But like with the Black Hawk, is it, was it just so superior? Like it was going to keep perfecting this airframe and the, and the future of the army is some other chopper or is it just more of like, no, let's just keep uh, perfecting this in a way. So, so we'll get to a point where we're really ready to retire it. Does that make sense? Yeah, no, it, it does. It's a great question and an interesting point for discussion. If you if you look at the Blackhawk, it was made when we kind of did the Big Five, right, in the late 70s. Yeah. Um, and, of course, who was our threat in the late 70s? It was Russia, Soviet Union, and, and fight on the plains of Europe. And we knew that they had mass. They had more of everything that we had. Well, they had more of everything. And so we built M1 tanks that could move fast and shoot on the move. First tank that could do that. We built Blackhawks that can maneuver forces in and out of the battle space. Mm-hmm. Chinooks in and out of the battle space. Patriot weapon systems to protect us from the onslaught of Russian missiles. And so the Blackhawk was designed to do that. Now, here's an interesting thing. The core of the Blackhawk, the heart and soul of the Blackhawk is the 11 passenger crew. Yep. The squad, the infantry squad. <laughs> the Blackhawk was built around the infantry squad. Mm-hmm. Uh, and to this day, uh, when we built, I, I filled the first 30 Mike models Did you? to the 159th at Fort uh, Fort Campbell. They went, and the first 30 off the line went right to Afghanistan. Whew. We we ensured that the design of the internal cabin could fit 11 combat loaded soldiers, and we actually had a problem with the seats. We made them too narrow initially, <laughs> so we had to change the seats because they couldn't get in there with their combat gear. Two pilots, nine crew. 11 infantry squad and two pilots, two pilots, two crew members. Okay. So Black Hawk has two pilots, two crew members and 11, 11 infantry men. So 15. Okay. So that has never changed. It's never changed since day one because the core of the fighting element of an infantry company is the 11 man squad. Yeah. That's the core fighting element. It goes from the squad, to the platoon to the company, the battalion brigade. And so if you, Take the original aircraft that was selected, then then we started modifying it over time to do to carry more, to go faster, to go further. So things started changing on the Blackhawk. We went from we went from metals to composites to mm-hmm. make it lighter, 
we went from a smaller engine to a bigger engine to, so you could have more power, carry more and go further and go faster. We went from um, straight edge blades to wingtip blades to get more lift out of the edge of the rotor system. There, there is a time and there will be a time when that system will be as maxed as it can ever be. It'll be as good as it can ever get. Mm. In other words, you're going to keep incrementally making it better until it can't right. take any more. Which is why in the Army Modernization Program, we started two new aviation programs, the Flora and the Fara, as brand new platforms. Not trying to modify Chinook, Apache, or Blackhawk, brand new platforms. Um, now, how long will a Blackhawk, Chinooks, and Apaches be around? I, I don't know the answer to that question. I bet you my father in 1967 flying a model Chinooks <laughs> did not think his son would be flying the same tail numbers in 87. <laughs> yeah. So... Um, you know, you start moving from um, manual systems to hydraulic systems to computer-assisted systems to digital cockpits. All those things are designed to make the basic 11-man carrying platform better and safer to get soldiers to the target. Makes sense. At some point, it'll be all it can be. It, it, you can't make it anymore, and you'll have to go to a new platform. Yeah. And I think the Army's got programs to look at that. I love that story of the the one that uh, one of the prototypes that like crashed, yes. but then they were able to come in and just put different parts on it and fly it out of there. Yeah, it, and it there was like no casualties, <laughs> limited damage, but they had to replace the rotors and like, well, just fly it out of here, out of the trees that because the new blades couldn't cut the trees up. Yep, like the old blades could, right? Yeah, the aircraft settled. The story goes that the aircraft they were having a fly off. It mm -hmm. was then called Fort Benning, and. uh and the Skorsky product at the time had a mechanical failure, settled in the trees and uh, chopped a bunch of trees up and tore the road blades to pieces. Oh. And uh, they came out the next day, replaced a few parts, as you just said, and flew it away. And they're like, <laughs> that's an incredible aircraft. <laughs> it's a good PR spin, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's a great, it's a great story. Anything else you want to cover? Uh, well, listen, I'll, let me just, let me, number one, thanks for the opportunity to yeah, be here today. Absolutely. And to, to share a passion of, of leadership, um, and, and, and supporting what, what we, what we want to do with this community in Huntsville. This is a phenomenal community. As you mentioned earlier, Mayor Battle, Mayor Finley, known him for, for a long time, just great leaders, great friends, ha have a clear vision of where they want to do. And, and they've done a great job, in my opinion, done a great job of that. Yeah. Of taking us in this community together. President Carr is part of that, bring, bringing us forward. The industry that's here is part of that. The Redstone is part of that. Um, one of the things that makes this community great, in my opinion, is because we have a defense focus generally as a community, you have this passion for this thing we call America. Mm -hmm. and, and, uh, and this passion for this republic that we live in that's got problems for sure, but it's things we can solve. And as we've talked about before, as we... When we really want to solve a problem, we can solve. America can solve a problem. Um, we machinate really hard a lot about yeah. how to solve it, <laughs> but at the end of the day, when we make a decision that we want them to do something, this country can generally, when it's coalesced into a team of one of one nation, can do great. The what people don't think about very often in this community and in, in most communities is whether you make podcasts, whether you make contracts, whether you make lo logistics parts, whether you're a design engineer. Um, if you're doing that in support of the defense department, then what you're really doing is helping our soldiers come home. Yeah. Right. They're never going to know you and me. Here's what they're going to know. They're going to know when they push the red button or pull the trigger, they, they kill the target they needed to kill. They're going to know that, that, that if we do our job right in building equipment and teaching engineers and teaching managers and teaching leaders and teaching all the community, that if we do it right, then we'll create the opportunity for them to come home. And that's all that a soldier can hope for is that opportunity. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, what drives me every day is that. What can I do to create the opportunity? Because I think about the young men and young women that didn't come home. I think about them every day. Yeah. And, and if a three-day class can help do that in some form or fashion, we may never know, 
but some soldier will know and some sailor will know and some airman will know that that something happened in somebody's mind in some meeting in some class in some visit that changed a little bit how they think and that may have created an opportunity to fix something a little bit better and then that little bit better may have brought them home yeah and so um, thank you for having having our team here today um, thanks for letting us share some ideas on leadership and and uh, uh, we've been really blessed uh, our family our our UH family and our family called the the Huntsville community has been really blessed and so thank you you're welcome do you miss it every day you miss the military <laughs> every day but you know being being in the defense business yeah it it's uh, and I tell my team this it's just a different set of clothes same mission just a different set of clothes don't don't lose focus on what we're doing for our for our nation yeah that's awesome can i i I have a hypothetical to ask you okay you've seen top gun maverick right (laughs) i have have you seen it multiple times a lot (laughs) i have too it's a really i mean the more and more you watch it like that's a really good movie what would you do have done at the beginning if you were the that commander who shows up tom cruise steals the plane to go to hit the contract of you know nine g's and he goes to 10 right so he, he you know he he proves it blows up the plane but like <laughs> what would you do in that situation well, if you remember the movie hondo the guy that yeah that guy the guy that was playing the kind of hondo. the the, mm-hmm. the manager guy he if, before he got on the plane he you remember he said to tom cruise i don't need nine, 10.1 yeah. i just need 10, 10. <laughs> just i just need get 10 us to 10 and then he went to 10.3 yeah then he went to 1 2 and 3 and then the plane had a negative outcome <laughs> <laughs> But it, the Kane, the general, the admiral, the uh, the admiral that came, uh, admiral or his call sign was Kane. Um, ho- hopefully, I would have done what General Slosher did. Hey, I, it didn't work out that great for you. <laughs> what we don't know is what they actually did with that program in the movie. We don't sure. know if they actually continued the program or they. We don't know that part of it. So the, the optimist in me says, they proved they could do it. They'll they'll make another plane and continue the program. Yeah. Um, we don't actually know that. That's just me being an optimist. But, but hopefully, um, hopefully that's the approach that that I would have taken in that situation. Um, there is a time to push hard. Yeah. And uh, sometimes you got to do that. And sometimes it, sometimes you need somebody to put an arm on your shoulder and go, "Hey, get well, some sleep, get some rest." <laughs> well, to your point of coming home, you know, later when, uh, when. Um, they're talking about the mission and you know, John Hamm, the actor that's playing the the guy that doesn't like Maverick. And they're talking about the risk and the, the reality of, of how dangerous this thing is. Right. And he's like, but we want the guys to come home. The whole idea of this is to, to make this happen such that they come home. Right. And there's that realization that that commander has like, Oh yeah, he's kind of right. We don't want to just have a death mission here. Yeah, it's, it's kind of like the coach, your co- coach story earlier, right? Yeah. We we don't want to just do good. We want to we want to have fun. We want to build a team. We want yeah. this to be different. We don't just don't want to win the game. Yeah. Well, I wish you all the best with it. Uh, maybe I'll look into attending if I can. I'll see if I can get. Yeah, it'd be super great. Thanks thanks for having us. Yeah, you're welcome. And uh, all the best. Happy New Year. And uh, this will come out on January 16th. That's just like. Tuesday. All right, super. So we'll do the Blackhawk episode and then this one, and it'll be a perfect fit. Okay, super. Thank you. All right, take care. All right.